in Matthew chapter 23 today for a little bit of our time. And this is one of those passages that I have a love-hate relationship with because Jesus goes hard on these guys. And the reason that it's so good is because they're all like the religious Christians, the religious elite of his day. They're called the Pharisees. Now I'm a church kid. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor. And so I grew up knowing that Pharisees were like the evil villains. They're like the evil villains of the church. You know what I'm talking about? They were the guys that they prayed the best, they gave the most, they walked around in robes, and everybody was like, wow, those guys are so spiritual. You know what I mean? And Jesus comes and exposes them for the evil people that they are. In fact, look at this in verse 27. This is so great. Jesus says, in chapter 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Ooh, he used the H word. That's a big one to throw around in Christian, Christian uh, circles for sure. In fact, why don't you turn to your neighbor and just say, just point at them and say, you hypocrite. Come on, right now, just in the most judgy fashion. Yeah, doesn't that hurt? It even just hurts like saying it. Like it kind of feels good, but it kind of hurts too, you know? Jesus looks at these men, he says, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. See, Jesus is referring to literal tombs where back in the day, in Jesus' day, they would put dead people inside these tombs and the stench was so bad because you're in the Middle East and there's just dead bodies inside that they would literally seal these tombs so the smell wouldn't come forth. But even after they would seal these tombs filled with dead bodies, like some smell would still emanate. So what they would do, somebody had this great idea, I know, it smells like death. Let's paint it really nice so people will think better of it. So they actually paint these tombs white or pink or these colors that look nice to try and detract from the fact that this smells like death. And Jesus is saying, hey guys, that's exactly the picture of you. You dress up all nice. You say all the prayers real well. You go through all of the religious actions, but on the inside, there's nothing but putrid, rotten, decaying bones. Wow, what a great encourager Jesus is. <laughs> and the question that I have for you this morning is simple. Are you alive? No, seriously, are you alive? You know, I spent the better half of my high school uh, career, if you will, like I mentioned, in this church bubble, which was fantastic. But, but I also spent the, the better half of this, this high school career of mine um, trying to outwardly play the part of Christian. You ever find yourself in that place? And so, man, I'm telling you, you ask me where a Bible verse is, I can tell you. You ask me what the dress code was for a church service, I could tell you. What worship song, who sang it, who wrote it, I could tell you. I could read the Bible. I could pray better than, than a lot of the people. Else. I could do all these things. But inside, inside there was emptiness. You ever been in a place where you're going through all the motions, but inside you know that you're a hypocrite? Ooh. Does it get any more real than that? Does it get any more real? What do you do in the moment when you've got all the religious activity down pat, but inside you and only you know that there's emptiness, know that there's hypocrisy? For some of us, you know the truth. For those of us in here who have been playing the religious game, we've been tithing and we've been volunteering and we've been doing this and everybody else would say, that's the picture of a Christian. Hey kids, look at that guy. When you grow up, I want you to be like him. He's the picture of a Christian. And all the while, you are just running so hard and trying so hard because inside there's nothing but death. That's you. At least that's some of us. And maybe you'd expect a little bit of encouragement from Jesus, but he offers none. Do you know what he calls you? A hypocrite. He calls you dead. He calls you a white-washed tomb. Why? Because you know it. You know better. You know what you should be, but you choose not to be. You are choosing to pull your worth and your significance from everything else. 
Paul talks about this in Romans 10. He says, my heart's desire, verse one, and prayer to God for them, his, Jews, his Jewish friends. Remember, Paul was converted from, from being a Jew. Now he's a Christian. He's going back to the Jews with the message, message of salvation that Jesus Christ is the way to heaven, not the law. It's not by keeping a religious set of, of, of laws and duties that you're saved. It's now through Christ. Paul's going back and he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Jews is that they will be saved. I bear witness them, uh, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For, for Christ is the end of the law and righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul seems to be indicating here, you can be zealous and even excited about the things of God and yet not know Jesus. That, that's, a little, that's a little scary. You're like, well, I, don't, I didn't think I was supposed to have fear concerning my salvation. Well, Scripture says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says you can have zeal and yet not know Jesus. You can have a passion about all things holy and all things good. You could be good at what you're doing and yet miss the point, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? This is a difficult thing for us. This is a really hard thing. See, everybody else is gonna focus on what you look like on the inside, but Jesus could care less. When I grew up, if you had a tattoo, you were going to hell. I'm just gonna be honest. From where I was, I was raised. If you had a tattoo, that was like you were born from Satan. I'm just gonna let you know. They're like, wow, we welcome everybody. And then somebody walked in with a tattoo and they're like, uh, security, somebody just walked in with, uh, with an ankle tattoo. Like, you know, seriously, it was, a, it was a, and we, or like if you had long hair, you definitely, you were doing drugs and you were a bad person. I mean, am I being, am I being real here? If, if women wore anything but a skirt to church, watch out. They're a feminist because they're coming at you at all angles. And like, like I'm serious. If you, were a, if you were a man and you didn't wear a suit and a tie, you were backsliding. I mean, we focus on the outside. And Jesus is like, I don't care what's going on with your heart. You can get good at the outside. You can get good at playing games. But even if you get good on the inside, there could be death. There could be disease. There could be destruction. Here's what I want you to know. Point number one. Point number one. You're not significant based on how spiritual you are. I guess another way to say it would be that your significance is not found in being spiritual. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all our righteous works are like filthy rags. Man, I gotta be honest with you, just in full transparency, there are Sundays when I walk out of here after preaching where I'm like, oh, yes, I nailed it. That was awesome, Travis. Good job. 13 people said amen when you preached. You nailed it. That was great. Or there's days when I walk out, I'm like, yes, everything went so good. Oh, that was awesome. Yes, and then God's like, hey, yeah, that was still like a filthy rag, but thanks, like literally. Thanks, God. Because even our most righteous of acts are still like filth to God. They are. That They are. Because even our greatest of accomplishments and achievements are laced with sin. Would you agree? They're still laced with, the, with, with sin. They're still laced with, with ourselves. And, and that's why I'm thankful that, that, that my salvation, my significance, my worth it cannot be tied up in how, quote, spiritual I am. You have met those people, though, right? Clearly who they're worth is tied up in how spiritual they come across or how spiritual they are. And Scripture's just saying, no, no, that's not the case at all. You ever tried to do something, by the way, your own way, only to find out it was a colossal, colossal waste of time? And so even, even though Scripture says, like, your worth's not found in that, it's found in this. We're still like, I know that. And then we're like, my worth is found over here. Like, we do it anyway. We go our own way. We want to do our own thing. And what I'm trying to say is like finding your, finding value and following God the way that you choose instead of the way that he chooses for you is not a testament to your value. It's a testament to your rebellion. And just so you know, 
We're not called to be rebellious towards God. We're called to be surrendered. We're called to live a sanctified life. And ultimately doing things your own way while looking the part, but internally doing your own thing, you know what I'm talking about, it's gonna leave you empty. You're a hypocrite. We are hypocrites. And it leaves us empty. We can, like the Jews and Pauls, they even have a zeal and a, an excitedness, a, a passion for the things of God, but still not know God, or at least know God in the way that we should. What's worse is that we can fill ourselves up with all things, quote, God, and all things, quote, good. We, we know how to act and talk and treat each other. And we can still miss it. Because your significance is not found in how spiritual, spiritual you are. Number two, your significance is not based, you're not significant based on what you've done. The things that you've done for God are not the standard for your salvation. Can I just preach at you that for, for a second this morning? The things you've done are not the standard for your salvation. I don't care how many church camps you've been to. I don't care how many missionaries you supported. I don't care how many buildings you put up. What you have done does not prove your significance to God. Period. Oftentimes for us lifers, we've been born in church literally, we try to start to throw around a little bit of the things that we've done. Well, I remember that time when I was this old and I did this for God and I remember the time that I did this and we do that to assert some type of dominance over new Christians and it's shameful and it's wrong and it's ridiculous because you're significant not because of what you've done. Now, I would also say this. A lot of us have walked in here and we feel insignificant because of what we've done. We think maybe that Jesus could never accept us. Jesus could never love us. Jesus could never take us in because of what we've done. And so we feel empty. We feel empty. And I would say it goes both ways. To the Christian who is arrogant, you're significant not because of what you've done. And, and to somebody who is lost and far from Christ and ashamed of what they've done, I would say, no, 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 no. Your significance is, is not found in what you've done either. It goes both ways. Do you see that? What you've done doesn't define you. What you've done, what you've been a part of, even what you will do, doesn't have to define you. Now, let's just keep it real. Have you been empty before? Do you, I mean, is this making sense? Have you felt empty? I mean, maybe you've had your heart broken. Maybe when he drove down the road and left you, you felt like you were going to die. And this insane, incredibly deep sense of emptiness came over you. Maybe you've lost a loved one recently. And now you just feel empty. Life doesn't make sense. Hey, listen, maybe it's the other side. Maybe you have had incredible success you got that promotion, you budgeted right, you got that stuff, whatever, and now you're sitting on a pile of dough, but there's a problem, you still feel empty. It's kind of funny, by the way, side note, when we talk about money, and we say money can't buy happiness, and everybody's like, amen, but then for people who like, don't have a lot of money, they're like, amen, but it sure would be better, you know what I mean? Because even though we say like, man, you know, wow, it's, 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 I'd rather be miserable and rich than just miserable and poor. You know what I'm saying? Like we have this idea, we don't actually believe it, but if you have a conversation with somebody who has achieved incredible success and doesn't have Jesus Christ, they will talk openly about an emptiness. And that doesn't compute with me because I'm like, buy a boat. You know what I mean? Like that would make me happy, right? But then you realize, like, no, none of it does. And you can actually be in a worse position because you have everything that everybody wants, and yet you still feel empty. Your significance, the reason, number three, is because your significance is not based on how much you've acquired. Empty is not a good feeling, <laughs> which you know, which I know. By the way, empty is one of the reasons why we can overeat. Yeah, I know none of you struggle with your weight. It's just me. But here's an issue. Sometimes I eat because I feel insignificant. Anybody else wrestle with that? Yeah? Nobody? Thank you for your honesty and transparency. 
And here's what's crazy. I eat at different levels and I recognize this. So if I have a great day, I'll be like, dang, we need to go celebrate with food. If I have a bad day, I'm like, oh, I deserve to go eat some food. If I'm bored, I'm like, I'm bored. I think I'm going to go find some food. Like at every level, I am trying to fill an emptiness that I think food can fill. Now, maybe it's not food for you. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe that fills the emptiness in your life. No matter how brief of a moment, maybe it's not pornography. Maybe it's a relationship with a a girl, a relationship with a guy. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's a drug. Maybe it's alcohol. I don't know what it is. We all do have our thing, though, right? We all do have our thing, though, right? Yeah, exactly. And we turn to that. We oftentimes turn to that. And, and it's funny because what fills, up, what fills us up, here's the truth, what fills us up in the short term is actually the thing that actually uh, magnifies the void in us. Because it fills us up and then it lets us down. You know, that's the cycle with, with like eating. I don't know if you realize that, unhealthy eating. It's like, oh man, and you eat, and then you're like, you walk by a mirror and you're like, oh, I'm fat. And you're like, I should probably eat more. And then you're like, am I lying? And then you feel bad that you ate more, so you eat more food because it makes you feel better. But then you feel worse. But we do that with everything. We do that with everything. For those who wrestle with pornography, you do the same thing. For those who wrestle with spending money that you don't have on clothing that you don't need, you do the same thing. You buy it, you try it on, you feel better, you go home, and then you're like, I'm broke and I can't pay my bills. What are you doing? I'll tell you what you're doing. You're trying to fill a void that those things can never fill. You're trying to fill a worthlessness. You're trying to be significant. You're trying to prove that you have value. You're trying to prove that you have worth. Blaise Pascal says that there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, only by the God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Inside of each and every one of us, there is a gap, there is a hole, there is a void, there is something that says, I need to be significant, fill me. And so we try to fill it with everything. And in our attempt to fill it with everything, we realize that nothing fills it. Nothing fills it, nothing. And so we begin to deny that the hole is there we begin to deny that the void is there. And the only thing worse than death inside of you is denying that there's death inside of you. And you know how I can prove this? Because you are the busiest people I've ever met in my life. We are the busiest generation. And you know why we do that? Because we're trying to be significant. And if for one moment we fell into our beds and didn't just fall asleep because we went to baseball and soccer and basketball and this and that and watched our Netflix and binged all season and did all, and we had this and we had that. Like literally, we are the busiest people in the human race ever, period, to ever live. We have to be. Because the moment that we get alone, we realize we're empty. So the busyness covers up the emptiness. But busyness can never fill the emptiness. That's good. That's Jesus talking. I'm serious. That That is God speaking to us today. That is what he is saying to us. The busyness can never, can never fill the emptiness. Ever, never, ever. And so today, I don't claim to have a lot of answers but I do claim to have this one. I only know it. I only know it because I've experienced it. I've only experienced it because uh, I've spent time in Scripture. That doesn't make me better. It just maybe makes me honest about the emptiness that is there. Romans 5.8. This is my favorite Scripture. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I, I can't tell you how many times during the week I have a conversation with somebody who's like, no, you don't get it. God can't love because of what I've done. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. God loved you even before you were you. No, Travis, you don't, you don't get it. I've played Christian for years. No, you don't get it. <laughs> even while you were still sinning, Jesus died for you. 
I talk to people who are terrified that they're going to lose their salvation. Well, what do I have to do to keep it? What do I have to do? No, no, no. You didn't do anything to get it. What, what, is Jesus going to impose some weird standard now? Now that you've spent a life sinning and I saved you despite your sin, now continue on perfectly or I'm going to leave you. Do, do you understand? Scripture says, but God showed his love. Other translations say demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. Your significance is not found in how spiritual you are. Listen, it's not found in what you've done. It's not found in what you've acquired. Your significance is found in three words. Three words. Found here and elsewhere in the text. Those three words, Jesus loves you. Your significance, don't blow me off, listen to me. You're like, that's an old school song, that's an elementary, it is. But it could be the most powerful theological understanding you ever arrive at in your life. When you realize that all of your work, all of your striving, all of your plans, all of your dreams will never bring you the significance that you could have in just realizing that Jesus loves you. That's where your significance is found. And I would say that's where your purpose is found. Seriously, this is where your significance comes from. Jesus in his love. Jesus loves you irrationally. Jesus loves you illogically. He loves you ridiculously. And guess what? Some of us walk in here and we're like, man, but I'm not deserving. Good. Get that out of the way. Because neither am I. And the faster that you come to the understanding that you don't deserve that love, that you can't earn that love, the faster you can get to the place where you accept that love. Listen, I know that we're all coming from different backgrounds and different places, but can we just take down the fake for a minute? Can we just be honest for a minute that we wrestle with our salvation, that we wrestle with our image, that we all wrestle with insecurity and identity and trying to be significant? I thought it would get better now that I'm a 37-year-old man with five kids and a wife and a mortgage, but somehow it's still the same thing that I wrestle with all the time? Can we just be honest about that and just settle at the fact that Jesus loves us? That's where my significance comes from, that's where the significance comes from, only from the love of Jesus Christ. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't to me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love. Listen to me, you're not significant based on how spiritual you are. You're not significant based on what you've done. You're not significant, ba- significant based on what you're, uh, you've acquired. Your significance is rooted in the fact that a God who is separated from his creation said, I must do something to get them to me. Because sin broke that path to God, God sent Jesus. 
And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made a way for us so that we could get to God. He gave us purpose. He gave us life. He gave us significance. Jesus' love for you has never changed. It doesn't matter where you've gone, what you've done, who you've talked to, what you've been a part of. Jesus' love for you has never changed. Your failures have never changed Jesus' love for you. Your shortcomings has never changed Jesus' love for you. Your hypocrisy has never changed Jesus' love for you. And let's just be real. Let's just get down to the nitty gritty. Because if we're going to show up here and do the, do the, do the difficult job of, of getting children ready in the morning, which is insanity, let's just be honest. Let's do the due diligence of being honest here. Because for some of us, you would say, sounds good. But guess what, Travis? I'm divorced. I know God doesn't love me like he used to. For some of you, you would say, you know what, Travis? If you saw what I was looking at last night, you would know that God couldn't love me because of that. For some of you, you wrestle with same-sex attraction. And you drop that in the middle and you say, there you go. Does God love me? You haven't even shared that with anybody because you're so terrified of the response. I want you to know this. Although Jesus Christ will never accept sin as okay in any area, in any realm, I want you to know that doesn't change his love for you. Each and every one of us have the opportunity to come to Jesus and say, my desires are here, but I know that your truth Take my desires and change them. I'm willing to walk away from them to have you. That's what repentance is, by the way. Like, you can't change what you want. Sometimes we think we have to change what we want for God to want us. God wants you, even though you want sin. Let's not play. Sin's fun. A lot of sin is really fun. But Scripture says that it kills you every time. Sin is fun for a season, but it will in the end kill you. Jesus will not. Jesus saves because Jesus loves you. Do you know what sin loves? Itself. It hates you. It's a parasite looking for a host. And it will use you for its own purposes, its own intent. Isaiah 53, I'm going to close with this. Oh, this is a good verse. It's, a good verse. it's so good I used it last week too. It's really good. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And upon Jesus was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by Jesus' wounds, we are healed. I want you to know your search for significance ends today. Your search for significance stops here. You are significant because Christ loves you. Because Jesus died for you. And I don't care how far you've gone. I don't care how long you've been here. I don't care who your daddy was, where you grew up, what side of town you come from, or where you currently reside. Jesus loves you. And that makes you significant. Amen? That makes you significant. So no matter what you're wrestling with, what addictions you're walking through, what addictions are gripping your life, that Jesus loves you. Loves you loves you. And I want to give you an opportunity to come to Jesus today. Now, there is no salvation apart from repentance. We know that repenting is saying, here's my sin. I'm walking away and choosing Jesus. And only the Holy Spirit can really work that process in us. But if you are truly willing to do that, to allow God to change your heart and your desires, to leave it all and follow Christ, then I'd ask you to pray with me today. There's no magic words, but I'm going to pray with you. You just pray to yourself. If you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Whether you're here live, or you're joining us on Facebook, or joining us on YouTube, or joining us some podcast, whatever it might be, I'm going to ask if you would to pray with me this morning. To surrender yourself and choose to get your significance from the blood of Jesus. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, just to yourself, Jesus. Right now, I want to hand over, and, and listen, your eyes closed, heads bowed. I'm leaving the spot blank because I don't know what it is in your life. Jesus, right now, I'm laying down blank. Fill it in right now with whatever sin 
or sins there are in your life, give it to Jesus right now. God, I'm asking that you take it from me, change my desires, change my heart. I repent of fill in the blank. I try to get away from it, but it pulls me back. I know it's wrong. It's got a grip on me. I need you to save me from fill in the blank. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me, that you rose three days later. Take away my sin. Wash my my heart and my soul. I give you my life. Make a home for me in heaven. In Jesus' name.